Grace to you. Welcome to Revive LA. I almost didn't make it here tonight. My car had broken down about 30 minutes before I had to leave, and I had to run to my apartment. And luckily, there's a new friend of mine there named Moses. He's in the back there. And I said, Moses, you got to get me through the desert to the promised land, and here I am. So thank you, Moses. It's a little stressful getting here, but all ties into the message. I um, want to thank Pastor Joe and Pastor Cindy Ramirez. You guys put this together and worked so hard and make this all happen. So thank you guys for allowing me to preach. A um, couple things I just want to throw at you, just three quick things, just so you're, you're cool and relaxed and ready to receive. Um, number one is the misconception about coming to church is that you have to have it all together and be perfect. It's okay to be in pain. If you're in pain, be in pain. If you're angry, be angry. It's okay. You're here to receive, and we're here to give to you. Number two, uh, never pre-qualify a pastor on what he looks like and how young he is, okay? Uh, we don't know where people come from. I have uh, heard a lot of people say, I don't like to listen to pastors that haven't been through stuff. Well, let me just tell you, my life has been rated at R+. Plus, so not a PG life. Um, lots of death, lots of tragedy, lots of trauma, and yet here I am speaking because of the anointing and the love of the Father that Niles and Amy were just speaking about. Number three, ready for this one? The anointing destroys the yoke. So whatever yoke and burden that you came in here tonight and you're all stressed out like me because my car broke down and I couldn't make it, the anointing will destroy that yoke and remove that burden. So anytime you walk into a church service and you do not get your burden removed, that was not the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you through a pastor, okay? So there you go. Got it? One, two, three. Be you, be safe. Now, we've been um, doing a sermon series uh, that Pastor Joe put together with Cindy, and it's called um, Approved. And um, I thought I'd kind of stay in that lane there, and the title of my message tonight is called Waiting for Approval. Now, you may think of waiting for approval as like, okay, I got a loan application, I'm waiting to see if it goes through. I've got a college application that I really want to get into this school. Maybe there's a job that you want and you're waiting for someone to sign off on that or maybe a medical procedure. I mean, there's just so many things that we're waiting for, for someone just to sign off on us, get it going, and there we go. We are launched and we get what we have been looking for. This is a different kind of approval and a different type of waiting. And so I'm going to release to you a story tonight that you may not have heard before. And that is the story of a man named Mephibosheth, and you're probably thinking, well, who would name their kid Mephibosheth, but that is his real name. Now, Mephibosheth is an interesting cat, and I'm just going to read to you from the book of 2 Samuel 4.4. Remember, Samuel was the prophet. He anointed David, king of Israel, really great prophet. You have to look up Samuel, but here's what it says in the book of Samuel 4.4. It says, Jonathan, son of King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel before David. What a piece of work he was. Had a son who was lame in both feet. Okay? So Jonathan, son of Saul, has a son who is lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and his son Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. So just give you a little background here on Jonathan, son of King Saul, the king of Israel, and then also David, King David, and kind of their relationship. So first of all, you must know that young little King David, the shepherd boy who would be king, he would go into the palace early on in his life, and he would play the harp and sing his psalms to King Saul because King Saul was tortured by these demonic spirits that would torture him while he slept. So his dreams were disturbed. This guy was having a rough time. And here is young David, the harp player, the shepherd boy. And he would come into the palace and play. And so obviously, David became friends with Jonathan, Saul, you know, Saul's son. And so Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, and Jonathan is King David's best friend in the whole world. They had a bromance, BFFs. Best friends for life. These guys were joined at the hip, okay? So Mephibosheth, originally, his name meant this. It meant contender with Baal. And he was destined to be a warrior and fight all the false gods of the Philistines, which were the enemies 
of King Saul in Israel. So he was destined to be a warrior, contender with Baal. He's going to go after all those false gods that these enemies, the Philistines, who wanted to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And that's what he was destined to be. But you know in the Hebrew what his name changed later to? And he actually changed his own name. Yes, you can do it today and you could do it back then. He changed his own name to man of shame. So contender with Baal, and now man of shame. What was he ashamed of? I'm glad you asked. So we go into this place where Mephibosheth has now changed his name, and he is in hiding in a town or a city, whatever you want to call it, called Lodibar. Lodibar simply means no pasture or barren place. There ain't no cows grazing there, no water flowing through. This is the lowest point. How would you like to be called a man of shame and then live in a town called Lodibar? It can't get any worse than this. So this guy, Mephibosheth, son of the Prince Jonathan, had been living this life, hiding from his shame. And remember, his nurse had dropped him and he became disabled. Now, why did the nurse drop him? The nurse dropped Mephibosheth because Mephibosheth was fleeing from David because Saul and Jonathan were fleeing. Now, why on earth would Jonathan, King David's best friend, and King Saul be fleeing from the palace? Well, let me tell you why. In certain takeovers of dynasties and kingships, remember David took over from Saul, the previous dynasty that was in, in place would always be afraid because the new coming order would want to kill off all the offspring of the previous dynasty to make sure that no one had a claim to their throne. Now, King David was a great guy. He never said one ill word about King Saul who came before him. He never bashed him, never talked bad about him. In fact, he respected him and looked up to him. But in Saul's fear, he thought because he was on the way out and everybody else was coming in that this dynasty takeover was going to happen. It would be like if President Trump tried to kill off all Obama's offspring. You know, thank God we lived in a democracy where that doesn't happen. But I'm just saying the, the, the ramifications of the fear that's involved during a new order of kingship. So Mephibosheth is with his nurse. His nurse is fleeing because they think David's going to kill them. And all of a sudden, he lives in fear of King David for his whole life. His nurse drops him, and he is crippled in his feet. He's crippled in his mind, and he's crippled in his heart. And this young man, five years old, lived in this low place of shame, not knowing who he was, completely afraid, and completely in anger for the situation that had happened to him. And isn't that true for most of us? We've had things happen to us as a child. Maybe a parent dropped you. Maybe literally and emotionally they dropped you. They didn't know better. They let go of you. And here you are in a place where you think you're crippled. And what is the first thing we do as children? We blame ourselves. It's our fault. We take the guilt. We take the shame. And that leads to this lifelong system of fear that is in place. Could you relate with that a little bit? I know I can. So Mephibosheth is living in this place. He's in shame. He's in fear. He doesn't know who he is, and he's a man of shame. Now, I want to take you back to a little time when Jonathan and King David were best buds, and they're at the palace. Now, I don't know if you remember when they became friends. Maybe you read the scriptures. Maybe you don't. But David, when he went to confront Goliath... And King Saul was there. It says that at that moment, Jonathan and King David joined together in their hearts. So Jonathan saw the power in that young little boy, David. And Jonathan was actually a lot older than King David, so they weren't the same age. And Jonathan's whole mission with his relationship with King David was really just to kind of usher him into the kingship, you know, to train him. Because Jonathan was a prince, so he's trying to show David, hey, look at this life that you could have, and I'm going to show you what it's like to be king, how to speak like a king, how to talk like a king, you know, how to act like a king, not to say something so outlandish that you don't look like a king. And he was really wanting to mentor him and just kind of guide him into the palace. That was Jonathan's heart for David as the, the son of King Saul. And so they had this beautiful friendship, you know, it was a mentorship, it was a 
friendship. They were sowing into each other. I think Jonathan kind of liked David's youthfulness and that he was just a shepherd boy anointed to be king. And, you know, it's kind of like the prince and the pauper. They wanted to trade places and kind of see what it was like a day in the life. And so that's what happened. And so one day, David and Jonathan are just chilling out in the palace, whatever you do in a palace, and they're just having a good old time. And Jonathan, the older one, comes to David, and he says, let's make a covenant together. Now, this is the kind of covenant that was typical for those days. It was a bilateral covenant, which meant that each person had to keep their end of the bargain, and it was sealed with blood. So they would take a knife with a certain type of oil on it, they would cut their wrists, and they would join them together, and they would mix the blood. This was a blood covenant. This is something you cannot erase. It is entangled in your blood. And for covenant-making purposes in that time, they were chiefly made for defense. So basically, you're saying to your bro, hey, if anyone comes after you, I'm going to attack them. And if anyone comes after me, you better attack them. And so a covenant was made. During this covenant, Jonathan, you know, he was a prince, remember, so he took off his kingly robe and he put it on David. And so David was automatically... Uh, royal in his covenant. Then it, um, he took off his armor. Now, at that time, there was only two swords in all of Israel. Two swords. And David got one of them from Jonathan. King Saul had one and Jonathan had one. So Jonathan gave him this rare sword. It was the only steel that was made. It was the only one of two swords, limited edition sword. Okay? So this is all part of the covenant making between Jonathan, the covenant head, and sweet little David. Now, then he gave him his bow and arrow. And that, that brought Jonathan such pleasure and joy. So it was something pleasurable he gave him. So he gave him something of royalty. He gave him something unique and rare. And then he gave him something pleasurable. And then he took off his belt and gave him his belt to seal the deal. All right, so the mixing of blood, the giving of these things. And now David and Jonathan had a covenant. Now what was the covenant that they made with each other? They said if anything ever happens to either, either one of us, because they come from two different kingdoms, two different houses, Jonathan, house of Saul, his father, and David, who's going to have his own kingdom and his own children. And they said this. They said, look, if anything happens to us, whatever happens, I want you to promise me that whoever goes first, you're going to bless my house, my offspring, my people forever, and they will always have a place at your table. So the covenant that was made between Jonathan and David was simply this. Hey, whoever goes first, you better take care of my family, protect their house, make sure they're royal, make sure they have a seat at your kingly table. And that's the covenant that was made. So here we find Mephibosheth, who isn't really aware of this covenant. He is the son of Jonathan. And just to let you know what happened to Saul and his son Jonathan, they were unfortunately killed by the Philistines. They're very enemies at a place called Gilead. And it was a terrible situation. Saul had rejected God. He had turned to witchcraft and called out for a witch, and he died with Jonathan, his son. It was a terrible situation. So Mephibosheth is an orphan now, living in Lodibar, and he has no clue what covenant was in place at the time. So I'm going to flash forward to 2 Samuel chapter 9, now that I've given you the precursor for everything. Let's get right into the word of God and hear what happens. So David one day is at the, his new castle, his new kingdom. He had defeated all of his enemies. He went on all these um, uh, crusades and everybody, all his enemies died and he's victorious and he's having a good old time and he's eating good, all his taxes are paid and he's, it's good to be the king. And so he's sitting there and he just says one day out of nowhere, he says this in 2 Samuel 9, 1, David asked his staff, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So David is seeking after someone to fulfill his covenant with Jonathan with. And he says, is there anyone? And do you know what that's what God the Father does every day? He doesn't sleep. God doesn't slumber. He doesn't need sleep. But he waits for you to wake up. And he's calling out and he's saying, is there anyone on this earth, in this kingdom, that I can bless for Jesus' sake? Because Jesus made a new covenant as our covenant head, and he's wondering who he can bless. Isn't that beautiful? Who can he bless? So David asks, is there anyone left in the house of Saul? And so we go down and says, now there is a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? Yes, he said, at your service. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? So he asked someone from the house of Saul, who is there? Ziba answered the king, remember this guy Ziba, there is still a son 
of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. His name is Mephibosheth. Where is he, the king asked. And Ziba said he's at the house of Machir of Emil, and he's in Lodibar. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, the place of no pasture, from the house of Machir, son of Emil. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of the late King Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. O oh, king, live forever, Mephibosheth said. So David said, Mephibosheth, he got all excited. Now for a king to raise his voice and exclaim like that, that's a pretty good honor. Mephibosheth, he couldn't wait to give his end of the covenant to him. At your service, Mephibosheth replied, I am your humble servant. Don't be afraid, David said. Now, why would you think King David would ask why Mephibosheth would be afraid? Well, the reason he's asking is Mephibosheth always lived in fear of David because he thought that David was always trying to kill him. That's why he was on flea in the nurse, and he always thought that David was angry at him, so he was trying to be respectful to the king. And isn't that true, our perspective of God sometimes? Sometimes we think, God's just trying to kill us. We're on run for God. And we're like, no, you have a covenant with a prince and a king. And you have a right to be here with the king. But, you know, that was his perception of David. It was a faulty perception. David wasn't angry at Mephibosheth, and God isn't angry at you. So we go on, and Mephibosheth bowed down again. And uh, David said, don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. What? King David's going to give him back all the land that was stolen, going to let him sit at his table with all his sons and his concubines and all these things and just eat and drink and be merry. And this is the opportunity and the kindness that the king is showing. David's keeping his end of the covenant. Mephibosheth bowed down and said again, What is your servant that you should notice such a dead dog like me? Who am I, great king, that you should notice a dead dog like me? Isn't it interesting the way we see ourselves? Mephibosheth thought that he was a dead dog. He thought that he was a nothing. He thought that he deserved to be in a place where there is no pasture. And that's what he replied to the king. What a stupid answer. The king summoned Ziba, remember the servant of Saul's steward of this house, and said to him, I have given you your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And so Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant, I'll do whatever you want to please Mephibosheth. And that's what he did. So Mephibosheth ate at David's, David, King David's table like one of the king's sons. Okay, we read through that fast. But basically, Ziba is now going to take over and serve. So now Mephibosheth has servants. He's really living like a king. And now he's going to sit at the king's table and eat. So Mephibosheth um, also had some children, but we won't get into that. Now we jump forward to 2 Samuel chapter 16. And this is getting interesting in the story. Because Mephibosheth is just start, slowly starting to unveil um, who he is. Now, obviously, he thinks he's a dead dog. He thinks he's a man of shame. But now he's being put into a new environment, right? Ever walk into a new place or like a fancy place and you're like, oh, I don't deserve to be here. But somehow the culture and the atmosphere starts to change you from, from your perception of yourself or so you think. So David and this servant Ziba, Saul's house, who's now serving Mephibosheth, David um, had gone uh, to um, flee from Absalom, his son, the Bible is so funny. It's like an episode of Game of Thrones in there because you got King David fleeing from his own son who's trying to take over the throne of Israel. His own son's coming against him. His own son's trying to kill him. He actually gets on the throne. So David leaves Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and Mephibosheth's just back home waiting for King David to return, still saying good things about him but still living in fear. So David... Um, and Ziba meet up as David is on the way to flee. And so the servant Ziba, and it says, When David had gone a little beyond the summit of Mount Olives, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, was waiting there for him. He had two donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisin, 100 bunches of summer fruit, and a wineskin uh, full of wine. What are these for, the king asked Ziba. Ziba replied, 
The donkeys are for the king's people to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit are for the young men to eat. The wine is for those who become exhausted in the wilderness. So Ziba is trying to present the picture like a lot of evil people do. You know, oh, I'm such a good person. Look at this king. I prepared all these things for you and for your, your warriors. Here, take it all. Take the wine. Take everything. And then the king said to Ziba, and where is Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, the king asked him. In that case, the king told Ziba, oh, um, I'm sorry, Ziba replied and said, he stayed in Jerusalem. He said, today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather Saul. So do you understand what's happening here? Mephibosheth, Ziba lied and said that Mephibosheth stayed and went to go reclaim the land of his grandfather Saul and take back his kingdom, the kingdom of Saul. That was a pure, bold-faced lie. But Ziba lied to King David to get him to think that Mephibosheth was after his kingdom. Now, you can't bl blame David because David is thinking, oh, well, my own son just took my throne and took my kingdom, so everybody's after me. And that's what he's thinking right here. So David replied to Ziba and said this. He said, in that case, the king told Ziba, I give you everything Mephibosheth owns. And in that moment... David broke his covenant with Jonathan because he was tricked, because he was deceived into giving away something that he had no right giving away based on the covenant that was in place. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you have got an enemy, and we're not going to give him any credit because his works are finished, but he has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and the number one assignment is to steal, and he wants to take our inheritance as believers under the new covenant. He wants to lie to you, to trick you, to get uh, all that is available to you from your kingly inheritance. He wants to trick you. And that's what he did with King David. And David immediately broke covenant. And of course, Ziba bowed down before him and said, may I always be pleasing to you, my Lord and my King, just like those self-righteous people. Oh, yes, look what a good person I am. And he's really robbing you. That's exactly what was happening. So David breaks the covenant. Now, time has gone by. King David actually is getting his throne back now. He's about 60 years old. And David returns to Jerusalem, the capital city, to find Mephibosheth. At this point, Absalom, the King David's son, has died. And the king's son is completely gone. And it's a very sad time because he loved his son, even though his son betrayed him. So you would think that Mephibosheth, good old covenant Mephibosheth would have fixed up his feet a little bit, combed his hair, went to the gap, got dressed up real nice, hired a stylist, looked fashionable and just ready to go. And he kind of looked more royal than before. You would think that, right? Wouldn't Mephibosheth with all that time go clean himself up a little bit? Let me tell you what the word of God says that he looked like. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king when he was returning. He had not taken care of his feet or trimmed his mustache, or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day the king returned safely. He still, with all that the king said to him and all the promises that were in place, he still looked like a dead dog. This man, like I said, wasn't just crippled in his feet. He was lame in his heart. He was lame in his mind. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, until you know who you are in Christ Jesus, until you have received the full abundance of your inheritance, and you can stand fast on the confession of faith in whom you have received and believed and know what's available to you under the new covenant, you will always look the part. You will always feel guilt, shame, and fear because that's what you think you are. Instead of grabbing hold of the truth, of the inner reality that has been purchased for you by the blood of Jesus under the new covenant that has nothing to do with your performance, it has to do with your faith. But see, Mephibosheth didn't believe that the king was as good as he said he was. He didn't believe in the covenant because he had lived in fear from the king. And so I guess my message to you would be make the promises of God and your inheritance through the identity that he has put on you through Christ by your faith. Let that be an inner reality. Because what's on the inside will permeate to the outside. But it first has to become an inner reality. So here he is, hasn't washed anything, looks scruffy. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth replied, My lord the king, since I, your servant, am lame, 
I said, I will have my donkey saddled and ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, remember the one that actually saddled the donkeys, the servant of Mephibosheth? But Ziba, the enemy, my servant, betrayed me. No kidding, Mephibosheth. And he has slandered your servant Mephibosheth to my lord, the king. My lord, the king is like an angel of God. So he's saying, I've been slandered, I've been robbed, I've been deceived. But, oh, king, you're like an angel of God, so you do whatever you wish with me. All my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from my lord, you, the king, David. And so he's not confessing his covenant rights. He's not saying who he was destined to be as the prince of princes. He is saying, oh, I deserve to die. I'm just a dead dog. You should have killed me a long time ago with my grandpa Saul and my daddy Jonathan. I'm just a worthless nothing who should just be dead, and you have the right to kill us. What a ridiculous answer. But you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. And so he's still confused about that. And then Mephibosheth says the all-time saddest line that got me so emotional when I was preparing today. And I promised myself I wouldn't weep when I say this line. But he said something so sad that is in the heart of many believers to this day. He said, so what right do I have to make any more appeals to the king? So what right do I have? What right do I have? I said, I don't, I don't have any grounds to stand on. You can do whatever you want with me. What right do I have? The king said to him, you said enough, Mephibosheth. That's it. I order you and your servant Ziba to divide the land. And so again, David didn't keep his side of the covenant. And because of Mephibosheth's timidity, not knowing who he was, and backing down and asking a silly question, what right do I have when he knew he had a right and he had a claim to eat at the king's table every day and every night because of his father Jonathan's covenant? Instead, he cowered and said, what right do I have? So the king split it with the enemy and Mephibosheth. How many of you feel like you're splitting your inheritance that God is so freely giving you with Jesus? You're letting the enemy of your soul take from you what's rightfully yours. What's rightfully yours under the new covenant? Peace, joy, righteousness, sanctification, holiness, restoration, reconciliation. All these things are yours. Don't split them with anybody. Get greedy about what is rightfully yours by inheritance. I'm going to close with this as the band comes up with pl to play good timing. So instead of even splitting it, Mephibosheth says, no, don't split it. Take it all. I don't deserve it. And at that moment, what Mephibosheth should have said if he knew who he was was, I am approved. I am approved. I am righteous. And he should have said his daddy's name, Jonathan. Jonathan, 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 Jonathan. And reminded the king that he was approved by a covenant that was already in place many years ago, before he was born. But instead of saying he was approved, he said, take it all. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, as receivers of the new covenant of grace and mercy and truth by the blood of Jesus, our covenant head, anytime the enemy comes to steal from you, you should say, Jesus, 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 and remind God the Father who he's in covenant with on your behalf and receive all that. I got one last story I just want to say now that you know you're approved. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for getting me excited about that. There's a great movie called On the Waterfront with my favorite actor, Marlon Brando. It's the one where he says, I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. And he just saw himself as a bum. And he was bullied a lot, you know? He had all these kind of people down on the docks where he worked, on the shipping docks there in New York. He was bullied by the union bosses. They tried to control him, manipulate him, beat him up, you know? Well, they really came against him because he wouldn't do the kind of evil that they were doing. So he's on the roof with his lady friend there, and he looks at her and he says, my whole life, I've been called a bum. I've been called nothing. 
And that all stops today. Guess what old Marlon Brando did? He went down to those docks where everybody was giving the stank eye. All the little Zybas and the enemies right there were just looking at him like, you don't belong here. We pushed you out. But Marlon Brando said something so wonderful. He said, I got rights too. And I'm going to press my rights. And I'm going to go down to that dock. And he stood right there. And he made sure he got in again. So please, ladies and gentlemen, whether you believe in God or not, I hope you do. If you haven't received Jesus yet, it's the greatest thing you ever do in your life. You don't have to change your life or change your behavior. You just have to receive. Call upon the name of the Lord. You will be saved. He'll come into your heart. He'll be your Savior. The Holy Spirit will work and minister through you in ways you've never seen or could even believe. And you will, your identity will change. Don't be like Mephibosheth. He hid waiting for approval when he was already approved. What did he have to do for that approval? Nothing, just believe it and know it was there. What do you have to do for the approval of God? Just believe that he loves you and know that he's there and know that he sent Jesus to cut a new covenant and kill that old law on the cross so that you would never judge or condemn yourself or call yourself a man of shame. You would call yourself a son and a daughter of God. There's no more waiting. The approval process is over. By your faith, you are approved in the kingdom of heaven, and you will reign in life through the one man, Jesus the Christ. That's a promise. Thank you so much.